Good evening, folks. A uh, little bit technical difficulties there once more. <laughs> anyway, we're uh, we are signed in. We're ready to go, and we're going to start the show. A little bit late, but we're here. We forgot to tell them it's a different time slot this week. Yeah, that's right. It's eight fifteen. We start. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Should have brought that up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to our Sunday night offering of astronomy outreach for April the second, isn't it? Yes, it second, is. Yeah. It's the astronomy show. Yay! Yay! <laughs> okay, which time zone Mark says? <laughs> it's our time zone. It really doesn't matter. That's right. we, we pick our own time zone. That's right. Uh, my name is Chris Kerwin. I'm your host this evening and creator of the social media channels known as Astronomy by the Bay. I'm an amateur astronomer and member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Yay! Uh, first of all, I'd like to <laughs> introduce... Our two regular co hosts come on, guys, take it easy on me. Uh, introduce our two regular co-hosts of the Sunday Night Astronomy Show, Mr. Paul Owen from Moon Shadow Observatory in beautiful Hampton. Hey, Paul. Hampton. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Wow. I'm just waiting for the t-shirt. And our other regular, and James Taylor. <laughs> Yay. <Hey>. Wrinkles. Other... <laughs> <laughs> He's wrinkle star. Wrinkle <laughs> star. <laughs> wrinkle star. <laughs> <laughs> Van Wrinkle. There's a good name for an astronomy guy. Wrinkle Star. There, there you go. He's an old like. guy and he loves his job. <laughs> Mr. Wrinkle Star. <laughs> Otherwise known as Mr. Mike Powell from the PFO Observatory here in St. John. Welcome, Mike. <laughs> Formerly known as Bino Bud. Now he's Wrinkle yeah. Star. <laughs> I gotta on. change my avatar now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, okay. Uh, well, on tonight's episode of the Sunday Night Astronomy Show, I've been feeling a little bit under the weather today, too. So anyway, we're here. Um, our moon, our celestial neighbor and constant companion. Uh, we have the largest moon in relation to its parent planet than any other moon in the solar system. And life on our world would not exist without it. Uh, tonight, we're going to pay tribute to our Luna, some of its amazing features, its orbital period, the effect of the moon on our tides, and more. Uh, we'll learn more about our moon together. Yeah. Also tonight, uh, Mike will bring back another Bino Bud for a fine binocular target of the week. I will be introducing another Rosanna's fun fact for us. Yep. Enjoy. Okay. I'll have a quick look at what to watch for in the coming week. And we'll also have your wonderful photo submissions to share as well. So this is a family-friendly, interactive, live comedy show. Uh, so, <laughs> so for those of you joining us from my YouTube channel or Facebook page, we're happy to try and answer all of your astronomy questions here in real time. And of course, we'd like to welcome back all of those who have been joining us through the local Rogers TV network. Yay! We'll support Rogers. Yay! Get the hands up. <laughs> okay. So let's get started then tonight uh, with tonight's program and look at our closest neighbor in space. Yeah, it's good to laugh at least. You got to laugh sometimes. <laughs> the stress just before this laugh, though, was pretty strong. <laughs> As it usually is when I go to click go live and nothing happens. Oh. That's right. Oh, well. Um, okay. 
Uh, can't go too long tonight. Clear skies and astronomical twilight starts at 9.02 and the moon is up. Yes, sir. Okay. Of course, they're mile an hour winds right now. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Um, Mike's going to start us off then with a bit of talk about our moon. Oh, yes. All righty. Oh, disabled participant sharing. Oh, hang on. I can make that happen. How about it right now? Humble in like Flynn. Humble. Yep. Yeah. Sure. <clears throat> Try not to laugh, Paul. <laughs> that is awesome. The white I covered speakers. up the wrinkles. I like the white speakers. Perfect. All righty. Let's talk astronomy. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about the moon. <laughs> da -da -da, as we said. So, what do we know about the moon? Well, what's it made of? What's its orbital period? What's its phases? What's an eclipse? We'll find out next year. <laughs> is there a dark side? What are some of the features? What is a blue moon? Were we really there? And are we going back? So this quickly. What is the moon made of? Well, there's an old saying that the moon is made of green cheese. Scientists have learned a lot about the moon in the last 50 years. We traveled to the moon and collected samples of some of that green cheese. You know what they found? It's actually made of rock. So mostly magnesium, iron, calcium, basalt, and aluminum. What's its orbital period? Well, the moon's orbital period is 27.322 days. Because of this motion, the moon appears to move about 13 degrees against the stars each day, or night actually, or about half a degree per hour. The changing position of the moon with respect to the sun actually leads to our lunar phases, if you didn't know that. What are the phases? A lunar phase or phase <laughs> of the moon refers to the appearance of the illuminated portion only of the moon as seen from the observer on Earth. So if you were on Venus and could still live, it would look a lot different than being on the Earth and looking at the moon. How's that? So we only witness phases because it's rotating around us. What's an eclipse? And this is very quick. There's two types of eclipse. One is called a lunar eclipse, and what happens there is when the Earth gets in the way of the moon and the sun lining up, and the Earth's shadow covers the moon, and we have a lunar eclipse. You watch it, and uh, we have one in November, and it turns like a blood red. And we have a solar eclipse, which we have coming up in hopefully 2024 in April, and what happens there is the moon gets in between the sun and the Earth. It gets perfectly lined up, and the moon's shadow is cast on the Earth as you see it going across there. And in 2024, it's just going to so happen that dead center part is going to cross right through the middle of New Brunswick. And we're all looking forward to that. Is there a dark side? The side of the moon that faces the Earth is called the near side, and the opposite side is called the far side. The far side is often inaccurately called the dark side. But in fact, it's illuminated exactly as often as the near side, which is once per lunar day. So there is no dark side, even though we all like Pink Floyd. What are some of the marks on the surface? Well, we have seas or mares that we look up at, and that's those large, dark features that we see against the bright moon. Uh, the Sea of Serenity, uh, Sea of Crisis, Tranquility, where the Apollo 11 landed, the Sea of Fertility, and so on. The mirror are large, dark, basaltic plains believed to have been formed by ancient volcanic eruptions. So at one time, the moon had volcanoes or at least lava flows. There's impact craters. Impact craters are the remains of collisions with asteroids, comets, or meteoroids with the moon. These objects hit the moon at a wide range of speeds, but the average, get this, is about 12 miles per second or 43,000 miles an hour. Wow. Uh, when these things hit, they're moving. There's a lot of energy in there. And it uh, throws up a lot <laughs> when it hits. We have craterlets. These are tiny, tiny little things. They're very small craters with a diameter less than five miles or eight kilometers, but still have raised walls. So that's what constitutes a craterlet. It's below eight kilometers, but it still has a raised wall like the big craters. Then we have mountain ranges. And here's just a quick example the Apennine Mountain Range, we all love to look at, right? The Caucasus and the of course, the Alps. We have Alps on the moon. So there's mountain ranges on the moon. There's crater ejecta. Now, what is ejecta? 
It's material ejected from the impact basins and distributed over wide areas. So after, say, a meteor or a comet or something hits the moon, it uh, causes a crater and ejects all this stuff out. And you can see the lines spread across the moon. And that's your ejecta lines. And there's all kinds around Tycho and some of the bigger craters. You can really see how these lines are spread out. And they go a long way. What is a blue moon? Most years have 12 full moons, which occur approximately monthly. But in addition to those 12 full lunar cycles, each uh, solar calendar year contains an excess of roughly 11 days compared to the lunar year. The extra days accumulate, so every two or three years, which is seven times in the 19-year cycle, there's actually an extra full moon. That extra full moon now has been called a blue moon. So the last blue moon we had was August 22nd, uh, 2021. And guess what? The next blue moon is going to take place on October 31st of this year, 2023. So we're going to have a blue moon in August. Also, a blue moon can be caused by, uh, uh, excuse me, astrophoric conditions, such as smoke or volcanic dust in the air. So particles of dust absorb the light, causing the moon to actually look a little bit blue. So that gives you the idea of a blue moon as well. Then the question came, were we really there? Well, in 1969, man first landed on the moon. And in 2009, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter took pictures of the Apollo 11 landing site. And guess what? It was not faked. Yes, we were really there. And the only way we're going to find out is what happens next. Will we be going back? Will NASA unveil plans to return humans to the moon by 2025? Astronauts are expected to travel in a new spaceship that combines the technologies developed for the space shuttle and Apollo programs, and we're actually going to land on the moon with the Artemis III. So we are going back to the moon. And guess what? Remember, the moon is always a spectacular, it really is, object to photograph or view through a telescope or binoculars. And there you go. That's my talk on the moon. <laughs> and stop share. My microphone was probably turned off the whole time, was it? No. Nope. <laughs> could, could you repeat that? Just like a silent movie. Huh? Who? <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Mike. There's a little spiel on the moon. A little bit about everything there. Yeah. I, I like the blue cheese theory or the green. You say green cheese. I thought it was. Yeah, they, you know, you're growing up as a kid. The boom was made of green cheese. Right? Yeah. I thought it was blue cheese. I don't know why. Well, that would be the second full cheese moon of the month. <laughs> the blue cheese moon. <laughs> blue cheese moon. <laughs> Mystery thank you so much. Boy, we're right on a roll tonight, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks, Mike. Good, uh, good overall coverage of everything there. You just took away my talks. So that's perfect. <laughs> oh, no, I just touched on yours. No. Okay. Paul, uh, Paul, you're up next. Oh, okay. Not her up. All right. Well, <laughs> on, on the topic of moon phases, I've got a little trivia thing here we were talking about uh, before we went live. And it's really interesting that, and I didn't know this until I started researching <clears throat> the moon a little bit. And there is a month of the year when, and it only happens very rarely, that we don't get a full moon, a whole month, zero full moons. So <laughs> I think to myself, how could that possibly be? You know, every, they cycle, it has to come every, well, actually it doesn't come. And basically, um, so here's what happens. Uh, it's in February and um, February, because it's such a short month, depending on when the moon cycles finish in, um, uh, January and when they start in March sometimes they skip February and they don't do it very often uh, but I'll tell you how many times that they did do it so since the year 1900 up to the, the year up and coming or uh, yeah the 2100 in 1915 there was no moon in February full moon 1934 1961 1999, the last one, 2018. The next time it happens will be 2037. After that, 2067 and 2094. So some of you folks out there are gonna be able to experience all of them. Most of us probably not so much, but that's very cool. 
But there's another even more rare incident than that. And that is um, a time that on February the 29th, when we add in that extra day in that year, there actually is a full moon on February 29th. And that happens, um, you see, the last time it happened was in 1972. February the 29th, the leap year, we had the extra day. There was a full moon then. And the next one won't occur until the year 2048. Then that's wow. where we have February the 29th, we will have a full moon. So that is unbelievable uh, and kind of cool trivia about the moon that uh, I did not know. <laughs> yeah, love that. And like I said, we will never have a blue moon in February, the second full moon, because we hardly get a full moon. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> But anyway, so that's just a little trivia I want to talk about. Okay, what I want to talk about about the moon is basically what does the moon contribute or how does the moon affect the Earth? And of course, the, the main way that it affects the Earth, I'll just, I'll just grab a slide here and I'll put that up. Just hang on a sec. Uh, probably this one here, I think. So it affects the Earth basically by the tides. And that's what the moon has the biggest um, uh, influence on on the Earth. The other thing that I just found out, as most people know that I, I, I take pictures, but I don't study the astronomy of a lot of stuff. And lately I have been, and I've been learning all these wonderful things. And the other thing is, it's not only the moon affects the tides, but so does the sun. And there's certain cycles and positions of the moon in relation to the sun that we actually get these really ripping high tides. And uh, so anyway, so that's what I would just want to just kind of cover for those who don't know a little bit about the tides and how it works. So um, when you're looking at um, uh, the moon here, it of course cycles the earth. When we're at a, a point where if, if I was standing on the earth where it says high tide and um, the moon is directly in front of us, that's when we're going to get our high tides and it's at the full moon or at the new moon. And what it does, it actually tugs on the earth and it actually squashes us out a little bit. And that's basically how the tides work. So as we, as the moon cycles, um, or as we spin, I guess, uh, we go around and actually have that um, uh, point of gravitational maximum twice a day called our high and our high tides. And so we have high tide and low, to low tide twice a day. But when the moon is actually lined up where it does its thing and the sun is directly ahead of it again, that's when the two gravitational poles actually work together and actually pull and we get those really, really strong um, uh, um, uh, tides and, and the, higher, the higher water levels. And I remember Kurt telling me that. He said that, you know, that you're, um, if you wait, do we get a full moon? And uh, it's usually the day or two after if you want to go to the beach to get those really, really high tides. And basically, depending on how they're lined up, like you're seeing here, you will actually get those uh, extreme tides. Now, it will do the opposite of that, too. And I think I have an image of it. Let me just see if I do or if I don't. Um, yeah, when it's on this cycle. So when you've got the moon on one side and you've got the earth uh, or the moon on one side and the sun on the other side, then there's actually tugging actually on both sides. So you're going to get the, the impact of the high tides, but they're not going to be the same as if the sun and the moon are all on one side lined up that way. So anyway, I just, I just thought that to be quite interesting. Um, and how the tides work, of course, is if you see this little white spot here on this first moon, that would be you. And then uh, the full moon, of course, it, it's going to rotate around us this way. And of course, the Earth is rotating at this at the same this, the same um, uh, direction, but at different speeds. And that's why we're seeing the tides twice a day. So, for example, if we were at say high tide at midnight, we would be standing here, and then the moon would be uh, there, and then we we would get that um, that squashing, if you will, where it actually pulls the water towards one side, the sun, of course, is pulling towards the other. Uh, then, as the moon rotates. So this would be going into low tide. So now we're standing here. So you can see now that the moon is still in the same proximity to somewhere on Earth, giving it that pull in that high tide. But as we rotate around, we actually will go into the lower tide. So this happens twice a day. So we get a high tide here, say at 6, and then we'll get another high tide at 12. We'll get, say, a low tide at you know whatever time that it happens to be. Uh, uh, of that particular time of day, because you always look at the 
the high and low tide times on your local um, um, channel and you can find out when that's going to happen. But that happens four times. So you get two low tides, two high tides in a run of a day. And it's all in relation to where the moon is sitting in relation to where we are on Earth. So this happens to everybody on Earth, and but it just depends on where you happen to be standing. So I thought that for those who don't understand some of the things that the moon does to us. The other one uh, interesting thing that I found, just one sec here, let me if I can just get over here. My mouse is not working good, so. Ocean bulges, here we are. So what would happen if the moon wasn't, we didn't have the moon, what would happen if the moon disintegrated? Well, first of all, we would have some really dark skies. <laughs> we wouldn't have the moon to ever uh, clear up or muddy up our skies with light. That would be nice. Um, we wouldn't have uh, the tides going the way that they do. Uh, the animals actually do a lot of their um, life cycle things based on the moon as well. So there's a, a lot of different things that happen with the moon. There was something I want to find, or I thought I had here, just hang on a second. Yeah, what if the moon didn't exist? So <clears throat> if the moon were to suddenly vanish, like in a sci-fi movie, our nights wouldn't just be darker, our world would be radically changed. Though at first, it wouldn't be hard to spot the difference. The most immediate effects of the post moon would be, would be small. So um, the tide times, uh, a bigger instant effect would be on the ocean tides. But to understand the impact, we need to know how the tides work. We've just talked about that. But that would be affected uh, greatly. Um, turtles and surfers, believe it or not, <laughs> with no strong tug from the moon influencing the tides, animal life particularly, in the uh, intertidal zone would have to adapt fast. Uh, the intertidal zone is a concentrated band where certain species thrive between the ecological communities of the sea and land, and weaker tides uh, would cause this band to become narrower, increasing competition for the jeopardizing survival. So it's got a fair bit to play with uh, you know, survival and how we actually, uh, even us as humans, go and uh, 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 fishing and whatnot, uh, the tides play a big part of that, especially for fishermen at sea. Anyways, those are just a couple of things that I wanted to uh, to point out about the moon and it's, and its effect that it's got on Earth. Um, there was something else I can't remember right now, but it'll come to me. Anyway, that was it. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Paul. I think one of the other big things probably does is it keeps us at a tilt too, right? So it's maintaining yeah. our 23 and a half degree tilt. So gives us our seasons. Oh, yeah. And there was another thing. Yeah, what it was, was somebody asked, what would happen if the moon hit the Earth? <laughs> it would pretty much, you know, pretty much obliviate everything. It would break the Earth into pieces. It would be totally gone. Mm -hmm. And but they say that the, the chance, the only way that that would ever happen really is if uh, something from outer space was to come and knock the moon out of its trajectory and then towards the Earth. So right. chances of that happening are pretty darn slight. Pretty but. Pretty slight. But if it did, <laughs> buy that bottle ticket. <laughs> Thanks, That's Paul. All right. Okay. Um, my portion is just gonna. I'm kind of be bouncing around too because Mike's talk was kind of bouncing around and on different things. So I'm kind of maybe filling in a few of the gaps. But uh, take a look here at what I can offer. Uh, just bear with me for a second. This over here. Okay. Um, okay, a little bit about uh, our moon and some of its missions. Hey, how did I get that shot? Oh, hang on, we'll do it again. There we go. Oh, very cool. I was offering a live feed one night and that happened. <laughs> it was an Air Canada flight coming into St. John. Just uh, happened to get lucky anyway. Uh, oh, you you know how lucky you are to get that. That's yeah. kind, of <laughs> kind of shocked me. Um, anyway, um, a little bit about the moon and some of the missions. Uh, so uh, parts of this are actually slides that I show to uh, some of the students that I present to in classrooms. So, um, a little bit over here, like uh, why we see phases of the moon. This is kind of a neat uh, little map from NASA here. So it shows the moon rotating around us and 
twenty nine and a half days. And on the right hand side there shows the view from Earth that you would get if you were standing on that point of the planet looking up back at the moon. So this is uh, one when I take the flashlight and I shine it at the moon in the classroom and uh, show them what they're seeing. But it gives a, a good feeling for uh, why we see the phases of the moon when we do, basically just uh, the way the uh, the sun is uh, shining on us or on the moon. Um, the moon is actually either five degrees above us or five degrees below us most of the month. Um, and then it passes these two points that we call the nodes. If the moon happens to pass through those nodes at the same time that the moon is just the right distance away from us, then we'll get a solar eclipse. But uh, that's from NASA. And I kind of like that one because it, it does help to explain it uh, to the kids I present to. So um, that's why I'm just kind of throwing a few of them in here. And like this one here too, uh, the average distance between Earth and the moon is about 384,400 kilometers. And all the planets would fit between us and the moon with a little bit of room to spare, but another 8,000 kilometers to spare. So almost the thickness of the Earth again. A um, little bit of a uh, capture of the moon through the telescope and uh, the Apennine mountain range there. Yes, there are mountains on the moon. This one's about 400 kilometers long. It has about 4,000 mountain peaks that are about a kilometer high or larger. Here's the crater called the Aristosthenes. Um, and just below that one would be the crater Copernicus. And uh, past that again is here's the, uh, the straight wall we call the straight wall. So that's a large cliff. It's about 110 kilometers long and about three to four kilometers wide, but it's just a trick of light and shadows and how light plays its trick on the moon. Uh, it looks like a very steep cliff, but it's actually just a, a gentle rolling slope. And it's visible about uh, one day after uh, the, uh, the first quarter moon. Um, now, since the dawn of uh, the space age, uh, more than 100 spacecraft have actually left Earth en route to the moon. According to NASA, now not all of them have made it, uh, especially in the early years, but the ones that did uh, embody some of the most amazing feats of human ingenuity ever seen. Uh, these, are, these are images here from the NASA LRO. Mike referred to that one, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, it put this little movie together, basically, from all the images that it's captured. Um, and it's been there for quite a while now. Um, here are all the missions that have made it to the moon, soft landings on the moon, uh, 22 of them so far and locations where they landed. Uh, now, during the, of course, the most famous ones are uh, during nine Apollo missions, 24 astronauts, all Americans, went to the moon, and 12 of them actually walked on it. Where did they walk? Well, they walked here, these places. So these are all the landing sites um, for, the, uh, for the six Apollo missions that made it to the moon surface. Neil Armstrong's footprint there. Um, I'm not sure who this is, but Apollo 16, one of the astronauts left a picture of his family on the moon. He said he took his family to the moon with him, so mm -hmm. I guess he did. Uh, Apollo 17, there's uh, Harrison Smith standing beside uh, one of the huge rocks on the moon. And uh, there's Apollo 12. When they went out, there's their lander back here in the corner. And uh, when they went out to try to catch the, uh, the surveyor spacecraft, they wanted to see how close they could land to it to actually bring back the data that was here stored on this, uh, on this uh, mission. Um, if you want a closer view of all the sites, this is something that you can get from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft uh, website on NASA. This is the six landing sites. Um, there's Neil Armstrong. So if you can see my mouse here, guys, or yes? Yep. Okay, so there's the footprints that Neil uh, used. Or that's his footprints leading up to the crater and back again. There's Lunar um, uh, Lander there. It's the camera and, you know, discarded uh, cover, there's some science experiments. Apollo 12, their mission, there's the Surveyor spacecraft, there's where they landed, so they were fairly close to it. Um, 14, 15, 16, 17. 15, 16, 17 had uh, uh, lunar rovers that we took to the moon and uh, drove around on the moon. What's it like to walk on the moon? Well, just kind of like this, I guess. It's like this one, because it would well, be fun. <laughs> Well, make sure you don't fall down, but <clears throat> one sixth of gravity. So you've got an opportunity to, to, to work like that. Lots of dust being kicked up as well. And here the dust goes straight up and straight down. Can only do that on the moon. Uh, not only did we walk around the moon, but of course we took our rovers with us. There's some footage from NASA. I think this is Apollo 15. Um, there's your science experiments just kind of laying there and one of the astronaut, uh, astronauts, of course, is doing the filming. The other guy's doing the driving. And there's their lunar lander. 
Um, you can see that here the dirt goes straight up and straight down because the vacuum there's, is not really blowing up and moving around at all. And they're bouncing around a bit too in one sixth gravity. <clears throat> Looks like a lot of fun to me. Well, <clears throat> I'd be doing that. I mean, there's no roads, you know, there's no, no speed limits, <laughs> no, no cops to worry about. Just, just go. Have like fun. You're on the beach. Just like you're on the beach. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, they, you know, they, they took rovers with them because they wanted to get samples of rocks in different places, not just to where they could walk to, but they wanted to drive out to, to different locations and pick up uh, more samples. They brought back over hundred kilograms of rocks, 800 pounds, I guess, of, of rocks altogether. Sent them around the world and scientists around the world had a look at them. Um, we did do science experiments too. These are the laser retro reflectors that we left on the moon. Um, we point laser beams at them and measure how long it takes for the uh, laser beam to hit them from an observatory here on earth. And we can measure the exact distance to the moon. Um, science experiments, I'm gonna turn that one up, I think you can get it. Uh, this is one of the science experiments that we did. Hear that at all? Wow. Can you hear that at all or no? No, I can't no. hear. <laughs> wow. Dave Scott from Apollo uh, 15. And uh, they're launched from the moon. Uh, their last mission, Apollo 17. I feel really sorry for the guy they left behind there to do that filming. Yeah. <laughs> hey. <laughs> you said you'd wait for me. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, that's uh, that's our last time we were on the moon, 1972. Since then, we haven't really been anywhere but this place, right? Uh, International Space Station. And uh, what are we learning there? Well, we're learning, you know, how to how to get around on the moon, or how to uh, how to live in space. Sorry, uh, this is the lunar reconnaissance orbiter. Um, this is the one that's been doing a lot of uh, imaging of the moon. Has been there since two thousand nine. Uh, it's a robotic spacecraft currently orbiting the moon in a, an eccentric polar mapping orbit. Uh, data collected by LRO has been described as essential for planning NASA's future human and robotic missions to the moon. Its detailed mapping program is identifying safe landing sites, locating potential resources on the moon, like water, uh, characterizing the radiation environment, and demonstrating new technologies. It has been in service orbiting the moon since June of 2009. It was only supposed to last one year. Uh, the mission was only for a year. Um, some of the things that it's been finding out um, are wrapped up in a couple of one-minute videos here. This was from NASA's Planetary Science. Sure, we get some sound here. Oh, hang on a second. Make sure we get our sound all the way up. There we go. Very good. Constance Orbiter's wide angle camera, WAC, is creating a photographic atlas of the entire moon. By stitching together thousands of separate images, scientists can create a global catalog of the mountains, craters, and rills like those seen here near the landing site of Apollo 15. Color and contrast in WAC images give us clues about the chemical makeup of the lunar soil. The sharp border between the seas of serenity and tranquility, for example, is probably caused by different amounts of titanium. Crater shapes reveal their ages. These three craters are like a time-lapse photo, from the youngest at the top, with sharp, well-defined features, to the oldest at the bottom, nearly erased by time. With the wide-angle images from LRO, 
we can improve our understanding of our nearest neighbor in the solar system. It's a wealth of knowledge that spacecraft has provided. It's just incredible, um, some of the stuff that it's done. Um, another one, quick one here is uh, a little bit about the evolution of the moon. I think this is that one, might be that one. Yep, about the evolution of the moon. From year to year, the moon never seems to change. Craters and other formations appear to be permanent now, but the moon didn't always look like this. Thanks to NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, we now have a better look at some of the moon's history. The moon likely started its life as a giant ball of magma formed from the remains of an impact on Earth about four and a half billion years ago. After the hot material collected into a sphere, the magma began to cool, eventually forming a crust on the surface of the moon with the magma just underneath. Around 4.3 billion years ago, a giant impact battered the moon's south pole, forming the South Pole Aitken Basin and sending debris as far as the opposite side of the moon. This impact marked the beginning of a period that would cause large-scale changes to the moon's surface. One by one, more huge collisions shaped the terrain, some forming large basins that would eventually fill in to become the dark colored patches of the moon. They began as normal craters, but soon started to change due to the size of the impact on the relatively thin crust. Because the moon had not yet fully cooled on the inside, lava began to seep out through the cracks caused by the impacts. The resulting volcanic activity spread lava throughout the craters, gradually filling them in and cooling. Because of the high iron content of the basalt in the rock, aria reflect less light and therefore appear darker than the surrounding islands of the moon. Volcanic activity ended on the near side of the moon as the last of the large impacts made their mark on the surface. The moon continued to be battered by other impactors, although they were much smaller than the objects that formed the largest basins. Some of the largest, most recent, and best known impacts from this period include the Tycho, Copernicus, and Aristarchus craters, which are unique due to the complex system of rays that stretch out from the impact site. Finally, we arrive at the moon that we see today. Though the surface continues to be affected by impacts, the rate is slowed down drastically to the point where the moon appears unchanging to the human eye as a permanent record of its own history and a glimpse of how craters may have formed here on Earth. Thank you. Of course, it's a NASA production, but it's still pretty interesting stuff, I think. Yes. Uh, one real quick look at the uh, Apollo landing site. Mike mentioned these. So here's a LROC, a Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter's view of the Apollo landing site from about 26 kilometers above the surface. Now that seems like a long distance, but on the moon, um, it's a vacuum. So there's no atmosphere to worry about. So we can get some pretty good images from that height. You see the, the trails here left by the lunar rover, all their science experiments. Some of the, the larger rocks. You okay? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, where they parked the uh, lunar rover. So these are these are available through NASA's LROC site, um, and uh, there's lots of images there. All right, from there. Um, you know, we spent the last, uh, what, uh, 20 years now, maybe, in low Earth orbit, just kind of doing this kind of stuff, learning uh, learning about how to live in uh, in the space environment. I think this is the mission where they changed the, the batteries on the space station. So pretty interesting, though. Got to make sure you get that hooked on there nice and tight. There you go. <laughs> make sure you're hooked on before you release the other one. Um. Again, that's what I like to show the kids when they're at it. But uh, here's our, you know, we're, we're heading back to the moon, of course, with our Artemis mission. There's the rocket that we're using, similar to the space shuttle and the fact that it uses two solid rocket boosters, but uh, it's a much larger rocket than Apollo was as well. Um, that's about it. Five, start. Three, two, one. Boosters.
This is the highlights of the first uh, Artemis One mission. That was the first 12 days of Artemis 1 mission. Of course, next up is Artemis 2. Um, that's the one that's going to, uh, to circle the moon, but not land. And here are the astronauts that have been picked uh, for the Artemis missions. Out of this group, four will be picked uh, for the next mission. That's a total of 13 astronauts there now. Um, Artemis, Artemis 2 is basically uh, the first crewed test flight to the moon since the Apollo missions uh, over 50 years ago now. And so they'll circle the moon, they'll spend some time around the moon, orbiting the moon um, in a large distance away from the moon, but then coming back to Earth and Apollo, or I'm sorry, Artemis 3 is the one who will actually do the landing. This one was supposed to uh, um, launch in 2024. They're building the rocket right now. Uh, NASA is going to pick the next four astronauts to travel to the moon um, on Monday. Um, and the announcement is going to come from NASA's Johnson Space Center, Ellington Field in Houston, the four astronauts who will be venture around the moon, traveling aboard NASA's Orion spacecraft during the Artemis II. The mission is the first crewed test flight on the agency's path to establishing a long-term scientific and human presence on the lunar surface. Now, the event is going to air on NASA television, the NASA app, and the agency's website. The crew will include three NASA astronauts and one Canadian Space Agency astronaut demonstrating this agency's commitment to international partnerships through the Artemis program. Now, uh, Canada's uh, contribution to the program is the, uh, is the uh, robotic arm, Canada Arm 3, um, which will be used on the Lunar Gateway, uh, the space station that will be orbiting the moon um, shortly, well, once after this mission takes place. So from here are the four candidates from Canada. Uh, from left to right, the other uh, Canadian Space Agency's four active astronauts, Joshua Kutrick, uh, 41, Jeremy Hansen, 47, Jennifer uh, City uh, Gibbons, 34, and David St. Jacques, 53. I think the favored one here is uh, Jeremy Hansen, but not sure. We'll find out tomorrow, I guess. Uh, if you're looking to tune in uh, to someone on Facebook with it, our friend Scott Skywatcher, Scott Young out in uh, Winnipeg, uh, who works at the Manitoba Museum, uh, is going to be offering it uh, as a live event uh, tomorrow. So you can tune into him there on YouTube. Uh, just search youtube.com, uh, Manitoba Museum, uh, and uh, he'll be broadcasting it live. So good luck to whoever the selection is. And that's about it for me. Oh. How about? Interesting times coming. Yes, yes sir. Indeed. indeed. They talked about that Artemis II mission uh, earlier today on the news. Did it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because it was well, coming right up. So they've got some news people down there now. Yeah. Uh, you know, waiting for it to, to do its thing. Waiting for the announcement. Yeah. 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 Should be exciting. So mm -hmm. it'd be interesting to see uh, get the, the first woman to walk on the moon's surface is supposed to be with Artemis 3. Right? So Canadian? Is she Canadian? Mm -hmm. there's, there's Canadian ones that are supposed to be going up there. The Canadian, there's a Canadian being picked tomorrow to go yeah. Artemis 2. And I think there may be a Canadian pick on Artemis three as well, I believe. Quite oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. But, so yeah, uh, there'll be a Canadian going yeah, tomorrow. Uh, well, we a Canadian picked uh, tomorrow for the Artemis two mission to circle the moon. And I believe there's a Canadian going to uh, for the first mission to land on the moon too. That's in 2025. So we're getting closer. So it's good. Like it's for the kids. Like when I watched it. I was watching black and white TV you know, with my brothers and sisters and watching Neil Armstrong's grainy footprints, you know, on the moon. They're going to get to watch it on the YouTube live, you know, probably 24 hours a day, you know, the, yeah. a live feed coming from the moon, probably streaming service. Who knows? But it'll be interesting for the kids today to to, to get excited again in, 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 the, in the STEM field, right? Yeah. 
look forward to. And, you know, the kids that are walking around today in elementary schools are, you know, they could be the first ones to walk on Mars. We're talking 30 years from now. So, yeah, they'll be at the right, the right age. So I mentioned that to the kids when I, when I see these big bug, you know, big bugs. Yeah. <laughs> when I say I could, I could be looking at the first person to walk on Mars, they get kind of excited. So <laughs> who knows, right? So, yeah, interesting times. Okay, that's it for a talk on the moon, I guess. Moving ahead on to uh, a vinyl bud talk, I guess, next. So, oh, okay. Shift, slide, throw, and yeah, yeah. tear. Yeah. Mm. All righty. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get him in there. Binocular Tiger of the Week this week by Bino Bud. If I was Austin Powers and telling you to settle down, it would be Al Beehive, the Beehive Cluster. Hi, hi. <laughs> M44. Oh, Beehive, baby. Oh, hi. Beehive. <laughs> M44, also known as the Beehive Cluster. <laughs> Star Cluster to Constellation Cancer. M44 is a bright, large cluster with an apparent magnitude of 3.7. It lies at a distance of 577 light years from the Earth. M44 is one of the nearest open clusters to the Earth and can easily be seen uh, without actually binoculars. It appears as a blurry patch uh, of light to the naked eye, and the cluster is best seen in binoculars or actually smaller telescopes or lower power telescopes. How do I find it in the sky? Well, we're shifting that season from the winter constellations and Gemini and Orion and all that good stuff. And we're moving into the uh, realm of galaxies here. So uh, between the two would be uh, Gemini and Leo. And guess what? It falls right in between the two of them as it crosses the sky. And actually, it's not southwest. At 2200, it, uh, I forgot to change this time or this uh, direction. It's about uh, 180 degrees due south. Uh, at 10 o'clock at night. So it's right there. You look up, find Castor and Pollux, go across to see the bright star Regulus and Leo, and bang, it's right in between the two and a little bit down. What are you going to see? Well, it won't quite look like this because, of course, this is a photograph taken through a telescope of the cluster itself. But, man, there's some beautiful stars in there, and it's a nice cluster. In 10 by 50 binoculars, there's what your view is going to look like, give or take. I mean, it's a nice, easy cluster to find. It's not difficult. It stands out against the background sky real easy, and you'll know when you're on it. Compared to the full moon, easy for full moons in size. I don't think anybody could dispute that. It's a big open cluster. And guess what? The <laughs> season is coming. Be prepared. <laughs> beehive. Oh, oh, beehive. <laughs> oh, fudge. And that's binocular target of the week by Bino Bud. <laughs> <laughs> Two thumbs up. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Mike. Oh, okay. I, love the, I love the cameo appearances. Yeah, yeah. They're awesome. Great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Okay. Um, we're going to go to Rosanna's Fun Pack next. Oh, I'll try. I'll try. I'll try to beehive. <laughs> try to beehive. Good luck. <laughs> All right. So now this is this week's. Rosanna's Fun Fact. Hey. Hey. Welcome back, Rosanna. I, uh, I didn't attend our local meeting this weekend, and I got to miss Rosanna. You guys got to say hello to her in person. That must have been nice. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Awesome. Yeah. Good to see her. So um, this week, Rosanna has got, of course, another timely and interesting fun fact. So let's just get right into it. She writes, hi, Paul. Have you ever had your mind made up for something you like? Perhaps cookie dough, ice cream? And then suddenly out of the blue, you are bombarded with fantastic choices like double chocolate, salted caramel pecan cheesecake and you have to switch that's how the fun fact was this week i was all set for one thing and then another thing something else appeared <laughs> but since um some of our surprises have appeared very close or or on april fool's day i am double checking less to be fooled and end up with basically just jello 
first, over the last few days, there have been a few chances to see Uranus with uh, binoculars near Venus. With another chance tonight, which was last night, which is Saturday, except here, of course, it's raining snow. <laughs> I haven't been successful yet, but this cool pick chosen from one of the picks of the month by the Planetary Society had actually made up for it. This capture, uh, this was captured by Hubble and it makes Uranus seem like a watercolor painting, but it's actually, it was taken uh, November 2022, but released this March. Fun fact, Uranus's North Pole will be pointing directly at Earth in the year 2028, when the planet reaches its northern summer solstice for the first time in 84 years. And this, modern art, maybe? No, it's a planetary collision. And this was uh, this still was taken from a video simulation, a very fun 17 seconds from Jack Carrigius, uh, Carrigius uh, at Durham University in England, showing the possible collision that could have tilted Uranus on its side three to four billion years ago. So this uh, and the credit was given again the fellow we just talked about. So that um, um, impact is what that they think possibly turned Uranus on its side. This photo also made a cool, the coolest space photo of the month. And the James Webb Space Telescope captured this image of Star Wolf Ray at 124, which is expelling gas at dusk that forms the ring nebula M1-61. The nebula spans 10 light years. The spikes of light coming from the Wolf Ray at 124 and other stars in the image are an artifact of James Webb's telescope's structure. The image was released on March the 14th, 2023. Now, look closely at the circle item, which is right there in that image. It was actually the brightest cosmic explosion ever seen but its afterglow was barely visible to Hubble. GRB 22-1009A was so bright, it overloaded satellite's gamma ray detectors. As a result, astronomers instantly knew it was very powerful, but could not measure it precisely. Telescopes operating across the electromagnetic spectrum abruptly changed direction to see what they could find. Some of the resulting work has now been released in a paper in the Astrophysical Journal uh, Letters, while other conclusions are still working their way through peer review, but are available as preprints. GRB 22-1009A's afterglow was bright, but also puzzling. The visible and X-ray parts of its spectrum were unusually faint relative to the extraordinary strength of its radio and millimeter waves. Now this chart here shows the GRB in totally uh, as truly a, a goat at this time. It is also a very long burst. So um, so there it is right there. And this is a reconstructed this reconstructed data. So the, compared to everything else, just look at the size of that. Unbelievable. X-rays from the original flash were reflected uh, off dust, allowing us to watch it for five days. So on day one. This is what it looked like. Um, after all this excitement, there was the news release about a Chinese lunar sample returning mission has found water. Researchers analyzing lunar regolith brought back to Earth in 2020 by the Chang'e 5 spacecraft found water trapped in glass beads. The, the beads are thought to have formed from lunar material that was ejected during asteroid impacts then cooled and fell back to the surface. There's enough water in these beads to suggest that the top 12 meters or 40 feet of the lunar surface could contain 270 trillion kilograms or 600 trillion pounds of water. Now, at first glance, um, uh, I was slightly skeptical about the glass beads, but I did find an article only four days old, and she lists the article, which we'll put in the, in the thing. Um, besides, if in 2015 water was confirmed on Mars, NASA confirms evidence that liquid water flows on today's Mars, why should I doubt water and glass beads on the moon? 
Besides, the truth is water was found on Mars long before that in 2005, April 1st, to be exact. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> and here it was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. And that is this week's. If I can find the music again one more time. <laughs> Rosanna's Fun Fact. <laughs> awesome. Oh, awesome. There you go. Another wonderful fun fact from Rosanna. Water and glass beads. That's cool. Yeah. Water on Mars. Water on Mars, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> never, never really thought about it like that, though. Yeah. No. Different. <laughs> I'll Thank never look at the time. Milky Way the same again. <laughs> <laughs> True. Thank you, Rosanna, for another great talk. Absolutely. Um, okay, uh, we'll do a quick what's up. I guess we're going to get going here. So I'll uh, go with that next. Uh, from Yang. Let's uh, bring it up over here. You rearrange my screens. And it should be, I think. Good there? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Just a quick what's up uh, this week. A um, little bit about their sky. Uh, <clears throat> this is tonight at 8 p.m. <clears throat> Courtesy of heavensabove.com. You can go there and click on the interactive. I think it's called the interactive sky map. So it shows us uh, the ecliptic. Um, here's Leo, our springtime constellations coming up, Hydra, Leo. There's Castor and Pollux and uh, Orion and uh, Canis Major, the uh, the wintertime constellations. As Kurt mentioned last night in his talk, uh, there are just you know, a couple more hours before they disappear throughout the evening. So our spring ones are coming up uh, early, and uh, we've got a couple of planets still available. There's Jupiter way down here, very close to the horizon at 8 o'clock. I don't know if you can get it or not. I haven't tried for it. Um, uh, this past well, this past week haven't had any good weather, but uh, it's disappearing. We must well say it's disappeared by now. Uh, we, but we still have Mercury and Venus that are going to be rising higher each night for a little while yet. So we've still got some time with those two. And so you still got some winter constellations to enjoy. Um, and we've got Leo here with our springtime uh, galaxies coming up in here between Leo and Virgo. So lots to look at for sure. Still, um, this is a view of our solar system looking from above. Uh, this is also from a Heavens Above page. And the reason why I bring this one up is because it helps me to kind of locate where things are uh, in space in our solar system and why we're seeing the planets that we're seeing. So here's the, the solar system itself and it's rotating counterclockwise and so are the planets. So if I'm on Earth here and I'm rotating counterclockwise and I'm, uh, I see the sun uh, sets first and then I see here's Mercury and here's Venus, and Mars is coming up later on. But in between the two of those, I see the planet Uranus way out here. So that's why Venus and Uranus are fairly close together or in the same field of view of binoculars. It's all in our perspective. It's all in how we view things, right? Um, if we take that same spot where Earth is right here, and you can see that Jupiter is now falling behind the sun. Uh, that's a almost superior conjunction. So it's disappearing from our point of view. Um, you can also see that Saturn here, if we were spinning around, uh, Saturn would come up before the sun come up. So that's what's happening as well. So that little bit of a map there, if you can follow through with it and realize that everything's rotating counterclockwise there from above, uh, you would see where things sit and why they are where they are. Another way is here from this, uh, from this uh, planetary uh, summary from heavens above as well. Um, in here, they list a whole lot of things, right ascension, declination, uh, the distance from the sun, uh, the rise and set times for the planets. And down in here with the ones that are in red are the ones that are kind of interesting in a way that uh, uh, opposition for Jupiter isn't until November 3rd this year. So we're going to have lots of good viewing for Jupiter right into the fall, into actually right into Christmas. Um, Saturn uh, doesn't hit opposition until August 27th. So good viewing for both planets uh, into late fall. Uh, the maximum eastern elongation, in other words, how far east these objects can be uh, when they set in the west, how far east they can be. Um, so Mercury is not uh, going to be at as far as east until April 11th. Uh, Venus not until June the 4th. 
then they switch over to the western sky, which means, uh, or the, the morning sky, which means they'll be trying to reach west as far as they can. And uh, Mercury uh, gets at that point at May 29th. So you can see April 11th, May 29th, there's not very much time between them. So it only takes 88 days for it to go around the sun. Uh, Venus will be a lot later. It'll be back uh, out into October before it gets to its western part. So we'll have our evening stars and our morning stars both uh, coming up. Now, um, Venus and Mercury do continue to climb. There's the ecliptic, basically, the path that the planets and the moon seem to take across the sky. Although Jupiter has almost all but disappeared from our evening sky for now, brilliant Venus and little Mercury continue to provide a nice early evening show. Both planets are not at their peak point in their evening sky yet. The ecliptic, or the path that the planets uh, takes, uh, make a, makes a steep angle with, this, with the evening horizon at this time of year. Um, Mercury will be the first to drop from our view as it heads towards inferior conjunction or that point between us and the sun on May the 1st. And Venus will remain in our evening sky for some time yet, uh, not reaching inferior conjunction until August the 13th. So we've got lots of time to, to enjoy Venus yet. So you can see that they haven't quite reached the top of their orbits, I'll say, at, uh, at this point yet. Uh, Saturn returns to our morning sky. The, the ring beauty Saturn is in our morning sky now. Um, this time in our early morning sky, about an hour before sunrise. By mid-July, it rises at around 11 p.m. and doesn't reach its best viewing opposition until August 27th. So we'll have lots of summertime viewing of the planet and its amazing rings and well into the fall as well. On Thursday, April 6th, we have our full pink moon. April's full moon, the full pink moon, arrives on Thursday at 1.34 a.m. Atlantic time. Uh, moonrise that evening, though, occurs at 8.42 p.m., uh, and the moon will join Mars, Venus, and Mercury in our evening sky. Now, the April full moon is often called the pink moon, named after the herb moss pink, which is one of the earliest wildflowers of the spring season. Now, sometimes this full moon is also called the sprouting grass, the egg, or the fish moon. Now, to the Mi'kmaq, the full moon is known as the birds laying eggs moon. On Sunday next week, um, Venus and the Pleiades are together. Keep an eye on brilliant Venus all week as it closes in for a close pairing with the beautiful Pleiades star cluster. Now, the two objects will appear together easily in a pair of 10 by 50 binoculars uh, by next weekend for sure. So nice, nice uh, opportunity for a nice uh, capture photo right there. As always, we'd like to uh, focus on Lisa's look up astronomy and more. Her chart that she sends me, sent this one in to me last week. Uh, this is for the April um, um, evening sky. So uh, she lists here again the events, uh, the dates, peak times for the uh, events, and uh, what you need to see it with, naked eye, binoculars, or a telescope. You can find Lisa at Lisa's Look Up Astronomy and More at Ruby Moonbeams on Instagram, Twitter, Mastodon, and Facebook. Thank you, Lisa. And we have our local calendar as well, the St. John Astronomy Club, which we're all members of here. Uh, and the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, the New Brunswick chapter, uh, Kurt Nason puts out this calendar for us. Uh, it gives us a six-week, uh, pretty well six-week layout of what's going to be happening, uh, the major events anyway, that are happening uh, throughout those six weeks. So you can find that calendar at sjastronomy.ca. Just go there, you can download the calendar. And that's uh, that's about all i got for this week. <laughs> now you got to read this one now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Uh, yeah. Okay. And, uh, oh, okay, stop sharing. We share, no, stop sharing. Yes, we have. Yep. Okay. There you go. Here we go. So, uh, from there, then just a quick few photos. And I think we're going to call it an evening after that. I think my photos notes up here. Bring them over here. Try this. And bring that one over here. The <laughs> 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 <Still> one <in> time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There we go. There we go. Okay. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> Keep that guitar handy for next week. I All right. <laughs>
Uh, Lisa Ann Fanning uh, sent this one in. She's, hi, Chris. I was out taking photos of Osprey, uh, which have returned in full force to New Jersey when I noticed the position of today's waxing crescent moon. Now, this was from last week because she had sent it into my Sunday Night Astronomy Show at Gmail uh, address, and I hadn't checked that one. Anyway, um, this. Uh, so she said this became today's game to catch an Osprey as close to the moon as I could. I think I succeeded. I guess she did. I think so. <laughs> nice shot. Great cause. Nicely Good done, Lisa. Yeah, beautiful. Well done. Uh, another one here. This one actually came into the other email address as well. So this is from Stefan. Uh, Stefan Picard says, hi, Chris. Here's a 25-second exposure with my Canon T1i with my new-to-me Sigma 10-millimeter wide-angle lens. Uh, camera settings are f4.0 and ISO 3200. Get up at 3030 to capture the Milky Way, processed in Photoshop and Lightroom. There you go. There you go. Nice. Nice stuff, Stefan. Um, from there, we're going to go to Denise Bond's picture here of the moon over Moncton on Wednesday, March 29th. Sweet. Denise. First quarter, beautiful. Yeah. Gotta love the first quarter. never gets old. Never gets old. And this one <coughs> from Mr. Oh, Rob Fanning. Uh, Hi, Chris. I took the shot of the moon near the American flag at my place of work, Bayshore Waterfront Park in uh, Monmouth County, New Jersey. Nice shot. Yeah. Send that one into NASA. Moon in the daytime. like it. Very nice. Thank you for that. Um, Chris Bollock sent this one in. Uh, Venus and Uranus on March the 29th. There we go. Oh, nice, eh? The two of them. Yes, sir. Uh, this is brilliant. Venus is to the right with the aqua-colored Uranus about one and a half degrees to its left, directly below first two uh, in 2023. Yep, first two. Right shot that Rosanna's been trying to get. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, details full frame DSLR 400 millimeter lens at f7.1, uh, 70 to 200 millimeter at uh, 200 millimeter plus two times teleconverter, one quarter of a second to ISO 12,800. Well done. Yeah, very nice. What's yeah. up, Chris? Nice to see somebody got that. Uh, Kathy Adams, uh, son, on Friday. Yes, sir. Yeah, still, still pretty active. Lots of spots on her. Lots of spots, yeah. There's yeah. Spots labeled. Well done, Kathy. Comes around. I think the other side's a little more active. Hopefully. Yeah. Let's hope so. Uh, this one from Joey Craswell. Joey, after the call, I went out uh, with the scope, but the skies were hazy and not very good. I managed to get focused, but guiding was poor with clouds moving overhead. I gave M44 a shot as the sky M44. Beehive. 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 <laughs> <laughs> nice. shot as the sky uh, seemed clear in that direction here's the result 10 by 30 second exposures of the beehive nice and done, good right stuff now. and he's got the the next one is ic 40 443 the jellyfish nebula that's a hard one to get nice job on that too yep he did a good job looks really good uh, four by 30 second integration live stacked well done. It's really hard to control that star that's right beside I it. That up in there, yeah. 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 Good job. Nice done, Joey. Um, we got uh, Mr. Powell with his moon shot. Oh, yes. yes. Finally opened the roof and got the moon. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a great shot, buddy. Oh, yeah. Lots of detail there. Yeah. Awesome. I think that was uh, 1600 frames stacked. In the best really? 30%. Yeah. 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 You did a nice job controlling the real bright spots on it, too. Mm. Yeah. No, thank you. When you get to that phase, like those those little small spots that are yeah. down the bottom left, like those, they're hard to control. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of detail and there are a lot of craters in there. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And this one. There you oh, go. Uh, Rowan, uh, the horse head in the front nebula. Now you're cooking with yeah. propane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Take an hour's worth of data and then you green. green. Yeah. yeah. I got tired of trying to capture it, so I just got the paintbrushes out and painted there you it. Go. <laughs> looks almost looks almost real. That's like it's paint by number. That's pretty close, yeah. <laughs> well done. That, that was actually only a, an hour's worth of data because I, I just got tired. I just couldn't take it anymore, so I just put together what I had, and um, and anyway, it, it turned out pretty good. Well. I, what awesome. I yeah, it went together very well. Was how nice the horse. How nice the horse actually turned in the blue yeah. nebula. Yeah, really, really that's nice gorgeous. That. Really nice. Nice to get that before yeah. the winter time ends. Yep, for sure. Well done. Good stuff, Paul. Yeah. 
All right. And if you guys uh, want to send in photos to us, you guys and gals, uh, we'd love to get them. Here's where you can send them to astronomybythebay at gmail.com. We love sharing them. Please send them in. Yes. And we'll stop sharing there. And I bring this on here, I think. Bam. Yeah, there we are. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's get to our closing comments, then, I guess. We're at that time. Okay, uh, so I guess uh, in closing in tonight, thanks again for all of your support out there. Special thanks, of course, to Rosanna for her contribution to the show. Rosanna, wouldn't be the same show without you. Really do appreciate it. Also, special thanks goes out to Trudy, of course, for all the shares that she always does for us uh, and uh, all, the, all of you who uh, continue to share our program for us. We also hope that uh, those of you who joined us from the Rogers Network uh, enjoyed the program tonight. <laughs> if you have more information... <laughs> About the wonders of the nice guy, you can find me at astronomybythebay.ca. Uh, remember, too, we do love getting your photos, so send them into astronomybythebay at gmail.com, and we'd be happy to include them on our next broadcast. And please let your friends and family know that we will be back here next Sunday night to entertain you on the wonders of the night nice sky. So now, for now, then, from Mike and Paul and I, we wish you all a safe week, everybody. Lots of clear skies, and as we like to say, guys, open your eyes to view the skies, keep your scopes, point it up. Good night, everyone. Thank you.